Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Dave, for the, um, the great introduction. And I'm looking forward to seeing my former high school classmate, Marianne, um, at dinner tonight. Uh, it, it's a, an amazing turnout that you have here um, for this workshop on um, uh, saddle using remote sensing um, to determine ET. Um, as, as Dave mentioned, it's something that, that I'm interested in for a number of different reasons. And USGS has the Landsat connection, of course, and, and I'm going to be talking a lot about how, um, how we're using Landsat within the whole Department of the Interior. Um, but also, as a, as a recovering water lawyer, um, I practiced water law in Colorado for 28 years before I went to Interior. Um, I know um, how, uh, shall we say, crude um, the methods are of determining consumptive use and, and how um, uh, rough our estimates have been. And in Colorado, where we've had to account for every drop of water, um, we're doing it with methods that are, you know, plus or minus 40 percent. And to have this kind of methodology that lets you get much more accurate and actually measure consumptive use as opposed to um, estimating it based on idealized conditions. Um, it's, it's really a breakthrough. So it's fun for me to be here. Um, you've got here all the experts in the room on how to drill down and calculate ET. And you've heard all morning about um, different types of applications. I'm going to take a, a step back and talk to you more about um, how the Department of the Interior is using remote sensing technology in general. Um, you know, we're, we're the agency that takes care of your land, um, your water, your natural resources, and we're using remote sensing to, um, to help us with those management responsibilities, to help us make better decisions. Um, and better protect those resources for future generations. This administration has been very committed to using sound science to support its policy making and its decision making. And using remote sensing is an obvious way to get impartial data that can help us with those management responsibilities. So we're using um, a whole bunch of different technologies to manage land, to get a better picture of climate, to look at soils, biodiversity, land cover. Um, also, another advantage for us, when we use remotely um, sensed information and get that data, we share it with state and local governments and everybody. Um, so it really becomes a nationwide benefit. That kind of partnering and collaboration is saving all of us money, saving taxpayer money, um, as well as supporting better decisions about natural resources. So uh, as we all know, the entire world is seeing pressure on our natural resources. Uh, we've got a world population now of about 7 billion and growing. We're expected to reach 8 billion as early as uh, 2025. And those kinds of numbers put huge pressure on land and water all over the world. What you see here is sort of um, what has become the iconic demonstration of uh, encroachment of development. These two pictures uh, taken 25 years apart. Um, show what's happened in Las Vegas. And this is the kind of information we have to have in order to make good decisions about where and how development should occur, about how to provide the resources that support this kind of population growth. We have to have accessible, comprehensive data. It has to be consistent. And we have to have a long-term record um, in order to be able to look at demonstrations like this and learn about what that means for other parts of the country. So um, Interior uh, has the Landsat program under USGS. Landsat is probably the best known 
of our remote sensing capabilities. And it's one of our oldest. It goes back to 1966. And our Secretary of the Interior at that time was Stuart Udall. And he called for a uh, continuous program of space-based observation. And he said, as the quote says up here, the time is now right and urgent to apply space technology towards the solution of many pressing natural resource problems being compounded by population and industrial growth. So 46 years ago, he was seeing exactly the same pressures that we're seeing today and um, realized the, the capabilities that space-based remote sensing could provide us with. Um, we've got you know, expanded and compounded natural resources pressures now. Um, we're looking at expanded energy development all over the country. We want to support that development. We want to support sustainable, environmentally responsible energy development. Um, we have uh, development everywhere from the Mojave Desert with um, commercial scale solar development um, to the Marcellus Shale. Um, which is producing huge amounts of shale gas. We've got increased wildland fire threats, oil spills, drought, climate change, and increased demands for water, um, and increased pressures on our water supplies. And all of those issues impact the Department of the Interior's responsibilities. Uh, this year, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of Landsat. The first imagery re was received from Landsat 1 in July of 1972. And um, 40 years isn't too long for some types of Earth observation, like stream gauges or weather stations. But Landsat is the only um, space-based satellite observation system that can claim this kind of historical record. Because of that, because of that long-term history, and because of the very high-quality data that we get through Landsat, it really has become the gold standard of satellite observation. So right now, we've got two Landsat satellites in orbit, five and seven. Um, Landsat 5, uh, as you all probably know, was launched in 1984 with a three-year design life. Um, you may have heard it was dead. It's not quite dead. Um, but it's um, hanging by a thread. Um, about a year ago, its data transmitter failed. And so imagery is no longer available from the primary instrument, the thematic mapper on Landsat 5. And, and that's of particular interest to this group because it's the thematic mapper that has the thermal instrument. Um, what we were able to do, the USGS scientists um, at the Aero Center were able to do is to revive the other instrument on Landsat 5 that had been dormant for um, almost 10 years, the uh, multispectral scanner. Um, it, it had been taken offline because of problems. It is now back online and transmitting imagery. Um, we're not disseminating. We're not processing and disseminating that imagery. We're archiving it. Um, after we get Landsat 8 launched, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, we'll take a look at the imagery that we're archiving now from Landsat 5 and, and see if it makes sense to disseminate it. Um, Landsat 7 uh, is still functioning well. It, um, it has a thermal imager, um, so we are getting thermal imagery from the Landsat satellites. Landsat 7, um, all the Landsat satellites have a 16-day repeat. So with the thermal imager only on Landsat 7 now, that's what we've got is a 16-day interval. Um, when we had both satellites functioning well, we had an 8-day repeat. Um, and that's what we'd like to get back to. And we will because we're going to launch Landsat 8 on February 11th of next year. Um, Landsat 8 is called the Landsat Data Continuity Mission, LDCM. It's, um, it will formally switch to Landsat 8 after a successful launch. Um, so that's when we get back to an eight-day repeat because it has a thermal imager on board. 
Our preparations are proceeding on schedule, and that's what you see here. In the upper left is the operational land imager that Ball Aerospace is putting together, um, uh, has put together. It's actually shipped out. Um, it, was, it was assembled in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, lower left, thermal infrared sensor built by NASA Goddard. Um, and then the right-hand photo is the spacecraft being assembled by Orbital Science Corporation in Arizona. So um, everything is coming together now. Um, the launch of Landsat 8 is firmly established. It is firmly funded. Um, the ground station capabilities are in place and also funded. But I think um, many of you are interested in what's going to happen next. Um, what about Landsat 9 and beyond? And I'm going to talk more about that. Um, but before I go there, um, I want to talk some about the applications that we're using Landsat for at the Department of the Interior. There are hundreds of them. Um, I'm going to talk about a few, but just as uh, Secretary Stuart Udall had in mind, we are using Landsat across the agency, wide variety of applications. And and the applications and the uses of Landsat data have really exploded over time. Um, Interior has put together a, a report on its uses of remote sensing in the land and water management responsibilities. It's an 86-page report. Um, now, that's not just Landsat, but it's all the different things that we use remote sensing for. And, and Landsat is, um, is I think by far the, the greatest um, uh, remote sensing capability that we use. So I'll mention a few specifics. I'm not going to go through this whole list. Um, we use Landsat a lot for land management operations. BLM uses Landsat to monitor grassland conditions um, and look at invasive species and, and figure out where our priority areas should be for um, for mitigation. The National Park Service uses Landsat for vegetation inventories. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uses it for information on habitat. Here's another whole list of stuff um, we use Landsat for. USGS is using Landsat to map coastal erosion along the north slope of Alaska. It's really important for the energy development that's going on up there and, and climate change is having a huge impact on coastal erosion. USGS also uses Landsat um, for damage assessment after natural hazards like earthquakes or landslides, debris flows. So let me get more specific. Um, here's, a, here's a wonderful use of Landsat imagery. Um, not just interior, but several of the different agencies that come together and collaborate uh, around fighting wildland fire. I just um, this morning got to visit the National Energy Agency Fire Center here in Boise. And of course, um, represented there are Forest Service, all the interior bureaus, FEMA, Homeland Security, um, and, and all of those agencies collaborate in these remote sensing applications to deal with fire. The, um, the application that's shown on the left, fire fuel mapping, um, that is used as uh, for its predictive capability. You marry that up with um, uh, temperature forecasts, and you can use this as a predictive tool to figure out where we had a pre-stage resources, where we, um, where we need to have boots on the ground. The, the lower right picture is um, the uh, burn severity assessment. That's a product that is a collaboration between the National Park Service and the USGS. They work together to um, put these assessments in place that um, quantify the severity of burns that have taken place. And that tells the Park Service what kind of restoration techniques are going to be most effective. What you're seeing there, you can't really tell, but it's the Black Hills of South Dakota after a burn. And um, what they'll do is use that information to make decisions about reseeding, 
um, about uh, whether any um, soil supplements uh, need to be used. So basically to guide restoration planning. Another application that's, um, that's widely used is the National Land Cover Database. This is a really comprehensive application of Landsat data across the entire country. It's produced by USGS, but they do it in conjunction with a federal interagency team. And it describes the land surface condition and the land cover of every 30 meter uh, square pixel in the entire country. Um, what it shows is um, three different things. The class of land cover, and there's 16 different classes of land cover, uh, the percent of tree canopy, and the degree of surface imperviousness. And this map um, gives you an example of all three. So on the left is tree canopy. In the middle, the different kinds and classes of land cover you see represented by the different colors. And then on the right, surface imperviousness. So you know this is really big picture. Obviously, when you drill down, you get uh, incredibly rich information that can be used by uh, county land planners, by um, by states, uh, anybody who's looking at um, development and the impacts of development can be assisted by this information. Agricultural experts, scientists, um, there's a huge variety of uses. Um, one other application that, um, that, that gets a fair amount of attention is USDA's National Agricultural Statistical Service. Um, they use Landsat to estimate crop areas and um, you can also get information about the extent and condition of different major crop types. So again, the colors on this map represent crop types. You see a lot of yellow and green in the Midwest. Yellow is corn. Um, dark green is soybeans. Uh, the red that you see in the Central Valley in California, West Texas, some along um, in Georgia, uh, that's cotton. Um, and sugarcane is in dark purple in Louisiana, um, southern Florida. So you can use this to get information to predict commodity prices. This is how USDA is um, forecasting what commodity prices will be. They also use Landsat to um, try to get a handle on crop insurance fraud. Um, and look at whether fallow, lands that are supposed to be fallowed under the crop reserve program are indeed um, being fallowed. And now to the theme of this workshop, um, metric uh, methodology proving itself to be invaluable. Um, this is kind of, this has become the iconic picture for uh, the, the metric application. Um, not too far away, Snake River Plain. Um, so again, as a, as a former water lawyer, um, I, I know what I used to go to water court with, um, very gross estimates of historical consumptive use on um, agricultural lands based on Blaney Criddle or Penman Monteith. And now with, with this kind of methodology that you all are so familiar with, um, you can create these water use maps with accuracy to the individual field scale. Um, and obviously that's a, that's a very um, lucrative uh, and valuable use of Landsat data. Um, so I'm a fan of uh, the metric technology, but it's not just me. Uh, this is a picture of Harvard University giving its Innovation in American Government Award um, to the University of Idaho, Idaho Department of Water Resources for development of the metric technology. And there you see Tony getting the award. Um, so you can see though that, that it's not just us water geeks. Um, this was recognized as measurably more accurate, faster, more cost-effective 
than traditional ways of calculating consumptive use. So um, it also recognized that we can't do this without the thermal infrared sensor. Um, so again, another, another reason we have to have Landsat. The metric technique is seeing a lot of use in a lot of different Western states. These are some of the ones that we've been made aware of. So it can be used for decree compliance, for interstate water disputes, water transfers. You heard about monitoring groundwater levels and groundwater pumping. Um, tremendous number of potential uses of that technology. And, and that's consistent with what we're seeing um, in the uses of Landsat in general. The uses are increasing exponentially. And we believe that that's due to a decision that was made by the Department of the Interior in 2008 to make Landsat data free of charge. The entire archive of you know, hundreds of millions of images. Uh, what you see here, by the way, is uh, Grand County, Colorado. Um, the three lakes are Grand Lake, um, the little one um, up at the top, Shadow Mountain Reservoir, and Lake Granby down in the middle. Um, the pictures are from 2003 on the left and 2010 on the right. These are Landsat 5 pictures. Um, and what it's showing is the beetle kill um, that had occurred in that county during that um, seven year period. You can see how things are a lot greener in 2003 and there's a lot of brown and red looking stuff um, in 2010 and, and that's the pine beetle kill. Um, which was estimated to have taken about 90% of the trees in that county. But the decision to make Landsat data free of charge caused an explosion of uses. Um, you can see on this chart that we went from a relatively small amount of usage before 2009. It looks like zero um, on this chart, but it was actually around 15 to 20,000 downloads per year. As of September last month, we surpassed 9 million images cumulatively. So now we're seeing upwards of 2 million downloads a year. Um, we see now about 20,000 a day. Um, so we now see more Landsat downloads in a day than we used to see in a year. And, and it's not just usage that has exploded, it's um, also the applications. Um, every time you turn around, there's a new creative application of Landsat data. And these are all helping us manage natural resources better. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn away from Landsat just for a minute, but I will come back. I wanna talk about some of the other applications of remote sensing technology that we use at Interior. This one is called VegDry, and that's short for Vegetation Drought Response Index. It's a drought monitoring tool that was developed by USGS. These maps are produced um, every, every two weeks, I think, and they're based on MODIS imagery, on um, NOAA's Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, on USGS's seven-day average stream flow statistics and precipitation data from the National Weather Service. The strength of this application is the integration of all of those different indicators of water availability and drought. Um, we see this used by federal and state water managers, um, really any kind of water manager. Um, it gives people a, a very timely, very local map that shows uh, the drought response. You really need satellite remote sensing to get this kind of drought information, particularly in remote areas, in areas that don't have good um, gauging information, good real-time weather data. Another application um, that we make of remote sensing is with synthetic aperture radar. Um, this particular application is a differentiation between native and invasive species. 
So we use this on federal lands to figure out where we need to do invasive species control. What you see here is um, in the larger picture is Phragmites. You can see how tall it gets. And one of, the, one of the reasons that SAR is able to differentiate is because um, it can see the vertical height, but it's also looking at inundation patterns, at soil moisture, at biomass, and figuring out what's native and what's invasive. From that, you can create this kind of map that's used by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Each different color shows a different classification of vegetation. And it also is showing Phragmites in brown. And this is, again, large scale. But we'll, when you drill down, you can, um, a, a land manager can then decide where they're going to put their resources in, um, in fighting invasive species. Um, one of the, the very rapidly growing areas that we're using um, remote sensing technology is in unmanned aerial systems. Um, and these things range from predator type drones to these little babies um, called ravens that uh, look like what the kids um, fly in the park. Um, lots of this technology was developed by the US military, um, but the military needs very um, new state of the art equipment and close tolerances. Uh, we don't need that so much, so we get the used ones from the military, and we can put um, instruments on these unmanned aerial systems and send them into places that, that you, you really can't get much else in. So we use them to monitor environmental conditions, to analyze impacts of climate change, to respond to natural hazards, to conduct wildlife inventories. Um, you can see that... Uh, it's not expensive to launch. <laughs> uh, anybody can do it. Um, so that's the Raven. These are different examples of the unmanned aerial systems that we use. Um, the Raven's on top, about a uh, little over four pounds. The T-Hawk is another one that we use, about 20 pounds. The T-Hawk was used last year to monitor the um, damaged nuclear reactor in Fukushima, Japan, after the earthquake. So, you know, you can send in one of these UASs without putting any lives in danger. And they did that. It took pictures of the turbines, of the reactor itself, of the pools where the spent fuel rods were being stored. And they used then that information to figure out where the leaks were occurring and then, you know, subsequently make a plan on what to do about it. The T-Hawk was used by BLM this summer um, right here in Idaho to take pictures of burned areas. Um, and they were able to get in a couple of hours of T-Hawk um, uh, photography what it would have taken two weeks to gather on the ground, that kind of data. So it really can be cost effective. And then there's the predator. That's the same predator that you hear about in Afghanistan. But they use it to fly the, the SAR in, instruments. Um, some of the applications, this, the predators have been used for wildfire monitoring as well. Um, they use it for border control. Um, acoustic studies, you can fly an acoustic instrument on one of these. This is a particular example of a wildlife um, inventory that we've taken using the Raven. Um, what you do is you put a, a thermal sensor on a Raven. This image was taken at 6.30 in the morning in March um, on the Platte River in Nebraska. And so uh, it was dark. Um, they're counting sandhill cranes. We're trying to figure out how many are returning to the roosting areas. You can't send a person in to count them. Um, and so they, they send the raven over at night. Um, the thermal sensor figures out, um, you know, it takes pictures of the bodies. And then they come back and count them and, and figure out what kind of roosting returns they're getting. So um, it, it's, it's amazing technology. And I don't think we've plumbed the depths of it at all. Um, 
we've used the Raven to track wildfire movement in real time, where you know you can't get people safely in there. Um, we've used it to measure flood inundation and things again that are changing quickly that you need to get a good handle on. We've used it to locate lost hikers and hunters. Um, so those are just a few of the, of the different applications that we make of this technology. So next thing I'm going to show you, and I'm hoping this is going to work, is um, the kind of video imagery that we can get from a raven. USGS and Reclamation and the Park Service are using a raven to monitor sediment transport on the Elwha River in the Olympic Peninsula in the state of Washington. And you may know that there were a couple of dams on the Elwha River, Elwha Dam and Glines Canyon Dam, that were um, privately owned, been there for 100 years, and they were recently taken down to allow for fish migration. And they, they were power dams that hadn't been used to produce power for quite some time. So the dams were taken down, a lot of sediment in the reservoirs behind those dams that had built up over 100 years. I just read something this morning that um, it was estimated that there's 24 million cubic yards of sediment in those two reservoirs. So all of that sediment is going to start getting flushed down the river and down to the mouth in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and so the, the engineers want to see how that's happening so that we can get a better handle on how to manage dam removal. So we're using a raven with a video camera to monitor what's going on there. Um, and you're going to see a video from just a couple of weeks ago. And you will see what the raven sees, hopefully. I think it's going to work. So hand launched, Raven weighs about four and a half pounds. There's a camera in the nose of that little airplane. It climbs up to about 400 feet above the ground. And now you're starting to see the water that's left in the reservoir. This is Glines Canyon Dam. It's being taken down in segments. And you can see the river running through it. So, so this is upstream. Down is upstream. It's going up. Um, the, the water is flowing up the picture. So you can see all the sediment that was there. And we're getting a better handle on the movement and distribution. Now this thing is going to land. This is hysterical. Um, they put it into a deep stall and kaboom. <laughs> and now they're coming to recover it. Isn't that great? Um, it's, it's actually designed to break apart on landing and then pieces recovered and snapped back together um, and used again. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, USGS has been working with a number of different federal agencies on a report that is intended to provide a roadmap to the development of even more UAS applications. And this report is almost done. We expect to have it out um, around the first of the year. And it's going to talk about the present state of unmanned aerial system applications and capabilities. Um, document what we think the potential future uses of, um, civil uses of the UAS technology. And um, talk about the technologies that this group thinks need to be developed in order to support those future applications. Um, this will also serve as a guide for um, uh, walking through the FAA approval process that you have to go through in order to um, to use one of the uh, UAS systems. Uh, let me come back to Landsat. Um, the free access, um, th that policy, not only helps keep our country, we think, at the forefront of scientific developments in the field, but we also think it has benefits to societies worldwide. The point has been made that having open access to remotely sensed imagery around the world plays a significant role in creating transparency, um, particularly 
for places where information is government controlled. It may not be made available. It may be modified um, uh, before it's made available. Um, Chernobyl is an example. Uh, natural or human-caused disasters, particularly in repressive regimes, this application creates a transparency that, that really doesn't exist any other way. And as the quote says, it, Landsat has been compared to the world's free press as a result of, of that application. Um, you can get objective data from many different uh, remote sensing capabilities, but having that free access is the key. And the combination of free data and the long-term historical history that Landsat provides um, makes Landsat a particularly important player in this particular use. So Landsat 9, um, maybe that's, that's why everyone has been polite and um, listened to me this far. Uh, whoops, that didn't work very well. Um, thank you. The, there was a report in, um, in uh, 2007, interagency, federal interagency report on the future of uh, land imaging in the US. And it recommended Interior as the operator of a continuous operational land imaging program. And, and you can read Landsat um, in those words. They recommended Interior because they thought it was a good idea to marry up um, the user uh, relationship, uh, the, the ground system um, processing, dissemination, and, and contact with user requirements um, that USGS has, marry that up with the design and build and launch responsibilities. Um, so that sounds like a good idea. Um, and, and we certainly bought into that idea. But in, in executing on that, and, and you have to know that uh, all, almost all of the previous Landsat satellites that have been launched have been NASA responsibilities. NASA did the design, build, and launch. And then USGS would take over the ground system operation after launch. Um, and that's a relationship that has worked really well. Um, and uh, unlike maybe some other uh, satellite applications, uh, USGS and NASA have worked, I would say, seamlessly together. Um, it did make sense um, to, try to, uh, to try to take over an operational program. But um, here's, the, here's the budget reality. Uh, each Landsat costs about a billion dollars to build over a four to five to six year time frame. Um, and to put that in context, USGS's annual budget is about a billion dollars. So this isn't a responsibility that either USGS or the Department of the Interior could absorb um, and just you know sort of cut back on a, a few other things in order to be able to absorb it. It had to have new money. Um, and new money is not available right now. Um, not just for the agencies, but um, if you know how the appropriations uh, system works, each appropriations subcommittee in the House and the Senate has an allocation. And it, that allocation is based on past history. Well, the allocation to the interior appropriations subcommittee isn't getting any bigger either. Um, and so we don't have new money um, to support Interior, USGS, taking over the Landsat operational program. And it was made clear to us um, by both Congress and OMB that we needed to rethink. We got direction from Congress and from OMB in connection with the uh, 2013 budget reviews to take a new look at technologies available that could meet the user requirements of Landsat. Um, and uh, to come back and report on what our options were and how much they were going to cost. Um, so, so we did. Um, our goal 
all along, and continues still, is to have an operational Landsat program. And by operational, we mean regular launches, launches that are timed to reduce the risk of a data gap, and no loss of Landsat core capabilities. So we did a request for information and put it out publicly, asked people to tell us what technology is out there that could satisfy those core requirements. And at the same time, USGS led an assessment of the current uses of Landsat data and the emerging uses and the needs of the, the people like you all who use Landsat data. So we then, we then had a, a good current feel for user requirements. We matched that up with the technologies um, that we got from uh, the responses to the request for information. What we're doing is looking at options now. We're working closely. Um, USGS and Interior are working with NASA, with OMB, with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to look at the various options um, and to figure out the path forward. We are, we are not trading off core capabilities for cost. We are looking at um, risks versus costs, but we're not degrading any of the Landsat core capabilities. Um, and, and hopefully, we're trying to enhance them. But there are risks, and there are trade-offs. Um, there's technological risk. Uh, you know, some of the things that, that people would like to be able to use don't exist yet and, and require additional um, technological development. Uh, there's political risk uh, because some of the options that have been proposed involve uh, data buys from uh, uh, like the European Space Agency or, or other um, foreign countries' space capabilities. Uh, there's political risk there. Um, there's schedule risk. Um, if we're uh, doing different kinds of builds, if we're, if we're um, counting on technology that doesn't exist yet, we don't know if we'll be ready in time for a launch. Uh, we want to launch Landsat 9 in 2018, 2019. We want to launch Landsat 10 in 2023, 2024, something like that. We'd like to be on a five-year schedule. So all of those things are being taken into account. Um, I have with me today a document that, um, that describes the user requirement process that we have gone through. And if anybody's interested in that, I can provide you with a copy. Um, it'll give you a little flavor for the kinds of things we're looking at and the kinds of capabilities that we're, um, we're considering to be core. Um, we think we're on a good path. Um, I wouldn't have uh, been as optimistic um, a year ago, but having now spent a year uh, having those discussions with OMB, with NASA, with OSTP, um, I think we are on a good path. All this is going to unfold in the President's 2014 budget, which should be released around the first week of February. Um, and, and I'm not at liberty to talk about a whole lot of detail or a whole lot of specifics right now before that budget comes out. But we're heading in the right direction. Our Secretary of the Interior will be personally involved um, in this decision. Um, and, and that's a very good thing. We're anticipating that in March of next year, right after the President's budget rolls out, we will have a workshop with Landsat stakeholders to go through very specifically um, the options that, that we think are worth pursuing. Um, and that will be in conjunction with the 2014 budget. So stay tuned. Um, the, the work that you're talking about in terms of educating uh, your delegations about the importance of Landsat, uh, that, that's wonderful um, that you're doing that. And, and it's something that um, you as Landsat users are uniquely 
um, able and qualified to do, and, and we certainly appreciate it. So here's my favorite quote um, about remote sensing. For man must rise above this earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. So that could be a Landsat motto. Um, it came from Socrates a uh, long, long time ago. Um, we at the Department of the Interior know very well how important these remote sensing tools are. We use them ourselves in a huge variety of ways that I've, I've scratched the surface of. Um, we're trying to fully understand the places that we manage. We know that our constituents um, and our partners are using remote sensing technology and Landsat in particular um, for what are increasingly becoming basic needs. You know, we couldn't get along without this stuff anymore. So we all need these observational tools to understand the impacts of our decisions and to make better decisions so that we'll have natural resources around for future generations. We at Interior are working very hard to ensure continuity um, in the Landsat program, and we'll continue to do that. Even in these times of declining public budgets, we are committed to making sure that we have the tools to fully understand the world in which we live. Thank you. We have time for questions? Yes. Okay, I'm ready. Questions, anyone? Yes. Absolutely. No question. Yep. Yeah, no further explanation required. <laughs> What else? Yes? Uh, looking at the uh, cost for uh, Landsat and no budget being available, is there at this stage doing any focused effort to internationalize Landsat with the, as been happening with uh, Space Lab? Mm -hmm. Because we, we know now that the China Brazil satellite is not producing images that we all had hoped for. The Indian satellite does not have a good thermal band. You know, that, um, that's a really good question. And that was part of what um, we looked at in analyzing the responses that we got to the request for information that was put out. Um, because there were, there were um, proposals along those lines. Um, one, of the, one of the downsides is that there is risk. There's a increased risk involved. Um, right now, uh, with the focus on getting uh, Landsat 9 funded and launched, um, we didn't think we had time um, to create a new international program. But you know, one of the things that, um, that we've looked at is uh, whether we could rely on the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 launch um, for some of the Landsat capability and then launch a small sat, you know, with a thermal imager. Uh, but, and, and that, that needs some thought, some additional thought. Um, but reliance on a foreign country is, um, carries some additional risk. It uh, could impact the enthusiasm for funding. Um, so we have to think about that as well. Um, and, you know, just as we are struggling to get the satellite programs um, to become operational and to have a steady stream of funding, uh, so are other countries. And, and ESA is in the same boat. And so all of those things kind of factor into uh, whatever decision is ultimately made. Um, we want to make sure 
that we're getting the best bang for the buck. And, and we think there are ways, I should have said this, we think there are ways to reduce the cost, but we can't reduce it sufficiently so that, that um, Interior can take on uh, Landsat responsibility without new funding. Um, but, but we're trying to, to figure out what that balance is between risk and cost. And, and because Landsat data is, is increasingly becoming kind of a basic need, uh, our risk tolerance isn't great. So just part of the equation. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, that, uh, I should have Tom Loveland talk about that. Um, because, I mean, one of the things that we're, it, it's not just a failure of Landsat 8. It's what happens if Landsat 7 blinks out tomorrow. You know, so we've got to be thinking about our plan B. And um, basically, I think, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at data buys. Um, we can't fully replicate all the Landsat capability, we can, we can help. Um, and that's the plan B. It gets expensive. Um, but uh, yeah, that's where we are. You know, ideally, when there's a National Research Commission um, committee that is looking at the future of Landsat. Um, and, and they said, when I spoke to them, that you know, if you really want to have an operational uh, satellite program, you have to have a hot spare. You know, you have to be ready to go with the next one a week later. Well, funding realities probably make that impossible, um, at least in, in our universe, um, in my lifetime. So uh, we're looking at um, less than perfect plan Bs, but, but there is a plan B. Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Um, we, uh, uh, there, the National Geospatial Advisory Committee, the NGAC, is a, a federal advisory committee to um, the uh, Federal Geographic Data Committee that looks at integrating geospatial programs across the federal government. And the NGAC recently established a subgroup called the Landsat Advisory Group, which is a wonderful, energetic, highly qualified group of individuals who are focusing on um, how they can be helpful to, um, to move the Landsat program forward. One of the things that, um, that we asked that group to do was to take a look at the economic value that is created by having Landsat imagery. Um, and they did that, of course, uh, one of the, the greatest values is uh, what the, the focus of this workshop is um, the use of Landsat imagery, the thermal imagery for estimating consumptive use and, and using that information for water management. Um, uh, and Western States Water Council had, had previously done evaluation of just that one application the Landsat Advisory Group took that information and um, integrated it with information from USDA uh, about use of the um, use of the Landsat in the Agricultural Statistical Service, um, the, the application that I mentioned, and, and a whole number of other uses, uh, emergency response. Um, I can't even remember all of them, but but they conservatively estimated the value of Landsat imagery at around $200, billion, uh, $200 million a year. Um, so 
uh, really, really uh, good unbiased um, valuation information. And, and that information is, have, was approved then by the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. Um, and it's publicly available. So to the extent that anyone um, is interested in um, looking at that information or providing it to others who might be interested in the economic value, we have it. It's on the USGS and NASA, I believe, Landsat website. Um, so it, 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 it's really, it's hard to get your arms around because so many of the uh, Landsat uses are um, academic and governmental. And they provide value, but it's hard to uh, objectively measure. This group has done as good a job as, as anybody can do at providing some objectivity to that economic component. They also did a white paper on um, why it makes sense not to charge for Landsat data. Um, because that's a question that, that we get a lot from members of Congress. Um, you, some of you may have heard it yourselves. Uh, why don't we charge for this? We're giving it to other countries. Um, it, if it's so valuable, why can't we charge for it? Well, you remember the graph. Um, you have to keep in mind that uh, something like 75 to 80 percent of the user community is governmental, so do you charge governments? Um, you know, for the data that the government is producing and providing. There's also a statute that prohibits us from um, charging more than the cost of distribution. Um, so that statute would have to be changed. But, but there's a very nice white paper. Again, it's just like um, one or two pages on why we shouldn't be charging for Landsat data. I saw other hands. Yes? Yeah, I don't know. Tom, did you hear the question? Could you answer? Great answer. Thank you. Someone else over here. I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are. Um, and that's what our request for information was all about. Um, uh, and, and we got some creative uh, suggestions. Um, all of them carry greater risk. You're always trading off risk and cost. Um, and the question is, how far do we want to go? Um, you know, for, if, if we're looking at a billion dollar proposition, there may be ways that are, are relatively risk averse to cut 10 to 15 to 20 percent off of that cost. So that's what we're trying to evaluate now. Okay, then. Thank you. You bet.